So welcome to Advances in Innovation in Musculoskeletal Health, uh, the spine. So tonight we're going to, going to address uh, musculoskeletal conditions of the spine. Um, our speakers today are Dr. Shakumbi. He is a spine surgeon at HSS. Um, we have Dr. Baxi, he's a physiatrist. And we have Vincent Lapino. Um, he is a physical therapist at HSS. Um, so we are so happy to have them here and we hope you guys enjoy and please use that Q&A feature so we can answer all your questions. All right, so I'll hand it over to you, Vincent. Thank you. So I'm really looking forward to learning a lot. We have two great experts here um, in treating spinal conditions. So I will start this off by asking uh, Dr. Baxi and Dr. Sukumbi, what are the most common spine conditions that you treat? Um, I, can, I can take the lead. Uh, thanks for hosting us and uh, it's a great question. So um, I would say majority of the spinal conditions I see as a spine surgeon are degenerative conditions. In many ways, the good news is that um, as we all age in our teenage years, in our early adolescent years, in our 20s and 30s, degenerative conditions really should not be that common. Uh, if most people should really think about these conditions as wear and tear conditions. You buy a pair of shoes, you wear them for a whole year, and you look at the bottom of the shoes and they're kind of worn out. Um, and, and that's a time-related effect. And also, we live on Earth where there's gravity. So you spend enough time on Earth, uh, certain things will start to wear and tear um, and, and these have to do with cartilage, these have to do with uh, uh, bone mass um, uh, uh, and quality. And so I would say degenerative conditions of the spine typically would include things that would surround terms such as uh, degenerative disc disease, um, facet arthritis, um, disc herniations, disc also called disc bulges or slip discs. Uh, these things in of themselves cause uh, a lot of signs and symptoms that, that people complain about pain, sometimes pain that radiates from their neck or their lower back into their upper or lower extremities. Uh, but I would say by and large, degenerative conditions are the most common things we see. Who is at risk for having these different spinal conditions? Are there certain risk factors for developing these conditions? And is there anything genetically that predisposes uh, someone for having these conditions? So um, I like to think of spinal conditions in broad categories. And like I said, the most common ones we see are degenerative conditions, but you should also think about categories such as trauma. Trauma could mean anything related from sports to car accidents to falls. Uh, so there's, there's degenerative, there's traumatic conditions. There are conditions that we would call quote unquote congenital type conditions that some people are born with. So um, perhaps you're born with uh, a failure of formation of one of the bones in your spine, and this ultimately leads to uh, some type of deformity. So, you know, um, if you think about it in broad categories, anyone is susceptible to a spine problem. You could be a teenager who's uh, playing sports and having an overuse injury, and as a result, maybe sustains a stress fracture in your spine. Uh, it could be more genetic, such as scoliosis, which tends to run in families, and sometimes it's actually more common in females and males. Quote, unquote, this is idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, once again, degenerative conditions, if you remove the genetic aspect to it, if you live on earth long enough, something is going to wear out. And um, it could be your, your upper spine, your middle spine, your lower spine. If you combine that with genetics that runs in your families, maybe you, you might, you might pre, be predisposed to earlier signs of arthritis in your spine than somebody who otherwise would be in their 70s or 80s. So if you just think about it as broad categories, traumatic conditions, degenerative conditions, and sometimes um, uh, conditions are induced by, by us. We go in to do something and there's collateral damage and something else breaks down down the road. So uh, that's how I would consider it. Thank you. And then I see Dr. Baxi just uh, joined us. So I wanted to ask, um, what are the most uh, common spine conditions that you're treating? <clears throat> yeah, so I I, I, I I sort of see it all like head to toe. So I, I treat a lot of patients that have um, have neck pain with with or without radiating arm pain, uh, mid back pain or thoracic pain and low back pain or lumbar pain. Um, I consider the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint or where the, the, the bottom of the spine meets the pelvis, also part of the spine. So, um, you know, I see, I see all sorts of back and neck pain or spine pain um, almost in every form. 
All right, thank you. And then um, I think this is a great question. I, I get this also as well from a, as a physical therapist. So as, a, as someone that may be experiencing these different back conditions, when would you know to seek out treatment from, from one of you two? Are there different like factors or you know experiences that you tend to see with your patients regarding this? So um, in most um, healthcare systems or institutions, there's a uh, algorithm um, as to how the patient flow happens. So a lot of times, if you're experiencing acute onset neck pain or back pain, um, maybe there was a trauma, maybe there wasn't an inciting event. A lot of times, you 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 end up uh, being triaged into a protocol that could hopefully enable speedy recovery without having to go through anything too invasive. So most people would be directed to as a physical therapist or a chiropractor for the initial stages. Um, and then uh, if things are getting better, then that's really all you need. Uh, and if things are not getting better, then you kind of go up that uh, treatment ladder, then maybe you then see a physiatrist who may offer you a more um, curated approach to your problem. That could be maybe a different type of rehab, that could be injections, that could be oral medications. And if things continue to escalate, then you sometimes end up in a spine surgeon's office. Um, but that said, some of the red flags that people generally should just be on the watch out for would be you wake up with a pain that you didn't have before. Um, time, if you give it time, most things do get better with time. Time could be on the order of days, could be hours. Um, I certainly would be more worried if you're having pain that is consistent and um, uh, um, chronic, meaning it's now several days, it's now several weeks the pain hasn't let up with routine things like rest, stretch. Um, if you wake up and you have a pain that's associated with something else, like a weakness that you didn't have before, that typically is a red flag. So pain and weakness typically is a red flag. Um, chronic pain can be a red flag. And then uh, anything that generally doesn't feel right. So if your balance is off, your, your cognition is off, your dexterity is off, these are more subtle findings that maybe something bigger is going on. But pain by itself, typically gets better with time. I will add to that, that, you know, I, my, my, um, one of my mentors always says pain, pain bothers you, but weakness bothers me. So, you know, I think pain is something that is, is obviously subjective and more often than, than not can, can abate, even if, even if it's, uh, the, the onset is acute, certainly with insidious pain, meaning pain that's more gradual, that can wax and wane um, that needs to be addressed for sure, but I wouldn't necessarily consider that kind of pain a, a red flag, but acute weakness or some, you know, like, a, like an acute neurologic deficit, um, an inability to do a simple day-to-day -day task that has changed dramatically in a short amount of time, um, I think is, is uh, somewhat worrisome. Yeah, I, I agree. And even just on the PT side, you know, we tend to see with pain and weakness, it really affects your function, whether it be walking or your day to day tasks. So that's usually what I tend to see, um, you know, people asking or seeking out these, these different treatments. So now uh, going forward, so I, I want to, I guess, um, uh, see Dr. Baxi pick your brain on this. What are the latest non-pharmacological -pharma pain management options that you use and are seeing in the literature? Yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting question. I think that um, there's a lot of things that I do that our field has been doing for a long time, and some of these things have sort of uh, passed the test of time because they're effective and there's good data to support some of the standard things that I do in terms of interventions, certain types of procedures, uh, medications. Um, I, I think there's a lot of interest in um, the regenerative or the quote unquote regenerative field of medicine in general for all sorts of indications. I, I think related to spine, one of the holy grail for spine care has been figuring out how to slow down the degeneration of discs, right? And, and I think we're all still trying to figure that out, but I, 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 I think it's out there and it's, and it's, and people are certainly doing this. I'm personally not, but I'm interested in it and, um, and we're studying it. It are like intradiscal therapies, uh, using, using cells, using patients own cells, whether they're stem cells or mesenchymal cells, uh, platelet cells. So, I mean, I think that is 
currently being researched in, um, in many of the big research uh, institutes like our institute and Mayo and worldwide. Um, you know, I think kind of taking a step back away from interventions and, and some of the, of the, of like the, the, the new and, and sexy interventions, there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of medications that I think are being found to be helpful for pain, things like medications that we have used historically for other indications, like even depression or seizures. Some of these medications can help mitigate nerve mediated pain. Um, you know, I think medical marijuana has been um, um, quite popular with a lot of states legalizing marijuana. I, I think that the medical use of marijuana has been around for a long time. And, um, you know, that's something relatively new that patients can incorporate to, to help their chronic symptoms of chronic pain. So, so there's certainly a lot in the way of newer therapies. I'm happy to go through some of them. Yeah, yeah. I guess like what are your top like two or three that you, you tend to uh, use with your patients? Sure. I, 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 so as I said, I, I mostly stick to the standard stuff, but with that being said, um, one of the newer, I guess, more interesting procedures that we, we do. And, and when I say newer, it's not so new. It's been around for probably 10, 15 years, but I think a lot of, there's been a lot of advancement in, in this field. It's, it's neuromodulation. So these are patients with recalcitrant pain. Many of them have had surgery. Um, and they have some form of back and leg pain, we can actually put a wire that can, can help um, sort, you know, can help sort of block some of the pain signals that are emanating from the spine. We can block them before they perceive them in their brain. So this wire is called a spinal cord stimulator. And it's an interesting field. I think that there's a lot to be still uh, learned and researched about this particular field, but certainly an option for, for some folks that um, are, are, have really gone through the gamut of traditional spine care. Perfect, I think that actually really uh, nicely seg segues into my next question. Uh, this is for both Dr. Uh, Sukumbi and Dr. Baxi. Um, in what ways have medical technology advanced in the recent years? How has the treatment of common spine conditions changed in your opinion over the last 10 to 20 years? And this would be from a both surgical and non-surgical perspective. Well, I can, I can start with that. Um, I think um, a lot of patients and consumers don't realize a lot of the advances that have happened, at least in, in the field of spine surgery. So just to put things in perspective, in 1960, nobody was doing MRIs on human beings. Um, and uh, MRIs did not become commonplace till the 1970s. And so that's when they started using more MRIs on patients and using it uh, as applicable knowledge to surgical intervention. Um, a lot of what we do, unfortunately, in spine surgery is after the fact, meaning you've had this condition, we're trying to fix something that's already broken. You have this deformity, we're trying to correct it. You had an accident, you broke something, we're trying to address that. Um, and over the next several years, I think there's gonna be a shift from, from being after the fact type of doctors to more preventative type of doctors along with the lines of Dr. Baxi was saying. I think at some point in the very near future, somebody's gonna say, hey, listen, we've determined through your urine that you're predisposed to having the spinal condition at the L4-5 disc. So I'm going to send you to Dr. Baxi who's gonna inject some stem cells from your adipose tissue into that disc so that you don't develop that condition at the age of 50. That's where we're headed. But I would say the, the, the primary, the, the two most significant advances in the field of spine surgery are pedicle screws and um, imaging. So uh, back in the day, if you had a spinal condition, there were only two things that one, that one could do. You could decompress the, the nerves of the spinal cord and put them in a cast or a brace, or just leave them after decompressing them. And, 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 at, and at the time, 20, 30 years ago, all you had in the operating room was x-rays. Nowadays, with the use of pedicle screws and rods, not only can you address decompression, you can take pressure off compressed structures, but you can also correct spinal deformity. You can correct spinal instability with the use of the screws and the rods. We never could do that 40 years ago. So that's game changer. Um, and then that has continued to evolve. So that, and that's what's traditionally known as a spinal fusion. And then we realized, well, maybe it's not appropriate to fuse everyone. 
because that causes more problems at other levels, maybe we should try to preserve motion. And that's where the advent of disc replacement came in. So disc replacement has been done for 20 years already. It's gotten better in the last 10 years, but it started over 20 years ago and that's evolved. And so remember I said, MRIs were not even available in the hospitals till the 1970s. Now we're almost at the point where we have in the operating room, we have CT scans in the operating room. While we're doing the surgery, we're using CT scans to, to increase our accuracy of placement of our devices. Uh, we're soon gonna have portable MRIs that we can use live during surgery. So, um, uh, so imaging and the, and the instruments we use would be the two greatest advancements in spinal surgery in the last 30 years. Excellent. And then, uh, Dr. Baxi, on your side, what do you, you know, I know you alluded to a little of this before, but what do you think that within the last 10 to 20 years has really been your game changer or within the field? Yeah, you know, I, it's like, I, I think in, uh, similar to spine surgery, um, a lot has changed. Uh, I mean, not much necessarily has changed from like a fundamental standpoint, but there's been a lot of evolution and improvement and enhancement of existing, um, you know, baseline sort of interventions, you know, just like in spine surgery, you know, a, a certain type of surgery has been done over the years uh, in a much more sort of efficient way, damaging less tissue, recovery is better. Um, so similarly with, with um, some of the interventions I do, um, I'll give you an example, you, you know, we do something called radio frequency neurotomy where we can actually ablate or burn or coagulate the, the sensory nerve that innervates a facet joint. The facet joint is just the, the joint that connects one segment of the spine to the one above it and below it. So if you have arthritis there, um, that could be a source of pain. And we figured out a way probably over, two, over three decades ago to um, burn off that nerve ending to reduce or eliminate the pain um, that you sense from that facet joint. Uh, Dr. Sukumbi, so this, this is a very interesting question. I'm really looking forward to your response on this. Um, so can you briefly explain what robotic surgeries are and what conditions are typically used for? I have a good depiction of what robotic surgery is all about. And the answer, it's, it's a complicated answer in the sense that it's very, it's very uh, exciting times now in spine surgery technology for robotics. But it's not really the robot a lot of people have in mind just yet. It's not the, the robots from iRobot the movie with Will Smith. Uh, it's not that type of robot. What, what really the robots do today is that they're, they're, they're really robotic surgeon assistive devices. So meaning I can't tell the robot, hey, go put a screw in this location without even touching it. And then it goes and does it itself. I still have input. And so what the robot really is, is a technology that allows me to place an implant into the spine in the most accurate and precise fashion possible. Me as a surgeon, if I, if I keep my hand in space and I try to do something, there's always some micro motion, there's always uh, some, some instability there, even though I know where I'm going. The robot is a fixed arm, it's not moving in space. So once I've done my calculations on the computer, I've matched it to the patient's body, um, that robot arm sits in the right spot, I can then put my instrument through the robot arm and that makes my accuracy and precision even better than if I were to do it myself uh, with just my bare hands. And that's where uh, robot technology is as of today in 2022. Um, but the, the advances in the technology are moving so fast that in the next three to four or five years, I'll be in Massachusetts on a computer on a different robot telling another robot in New York what to do and he'll be doing it in real time. So. Um, and I'm gonna show you guys what a robot arm looks like. And tell me if you can see it. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so, so this is, believe it or not, this is a robot. It doesn't look like anything fancy, uh, but this is the robot arm that is very precise. The, the little screen up top is a navigation screen that even though the patient is down here, the surgeon is looking up at the navigation screen. That's the spine there. And as he advances his instrument through this robot arm that's steady, he can see the instrument advancing on that image right there. So that's what the robot as of today looks like. Um, not, not, not what you would expect from a movie, but uh, this is a very 
one of the earlier generations of a robot in spine surgery. So it's not really what people think, but it does help. And uh, this, it's, uh, it's continuing to evolve every day. Excellent. So it's, I'm glad to hear that you will be controlling the robot. The robot does not have a mind of its own. <laughs> um, not yet, it doesn't. <laughs> Um, and then also, could you provide an overview on how minimally invasive spine surgery is different from a traditional spine surgery for these conditions? Well, great. I'm going to share my screen again because I have another slide Perfect. that kind of talks about that. And I hate to, um, to be the harbinger of bad news, but the truth is today in 2022, majority of spine surgeons are doing some form of minimally invasive surgery. So back in the day, um, when people traditionally would talk about minimally invasive surgery, they refer to open surgeries, bigger incisions, bigger exposures, bigger blood loss, higher risk of infection, things of that nature. We've realized over the years that with the newer technology and advancement in technologies, we're able to accomplish almost the same degree uh, uh, of efficiency of surgery through smaller incisions and better instruments. And so if you look at the practice of spine surgery from this 1970s to 2022, one could argue that everyone is doing minimally invasive surgery. Now, even within the term minimally invasive surgery, there are many different types of techniques that count as minimally invasive surgery. So the image on the top left, for example, this is what this, this is minimally invasive surgery via tubes. These are uh, hollow tubes where you have a light source that goes into the patient's body. You're not doing a big incision. You can see the size of the tubes. There's a camera that goes into those tubes, and then you do the work through a microscope and through that camera. So that's a type of minimally invasive surgery. On the right side, you can see several small wounds and tubes sticking out of the small wounds while screws have been put into the spine through these tubes. That's also minimally invasive surgery. The top of uh, the bottom left corner is two small portals going into the spine. These are actually connected to a camera that you can see on the screen right here uh, on the uh, bottom right. And, and, that, and that's called endoscopic minimally invasive surgery. Um, but interestingly, once again, these are all different techniques, widely different techniques, but they're all considered minimally invasive surgery. One could even make the argument that what's the difference between having one midline incision and four or six stab incisions? The literature, our research shows that if you were to do a type of minimally invasive technique, it doesn't matter which one you do, potentially your recovery is actually quicker within the first six weeks. But the research also shows that it doesn't matter what type of minimally invasive surgery you do or hybrid technique you do at three months after surgery, six months after surgery, one year after surgery, those patients are doing equally as good. So um, I don't think people should be bogged down with um, the term minimally invasive, I think is used very vaguely, very loosely. The devil is in the details. I think what, what, what matters more than the, the, the catchphrase minimally invasive is, is your surgeon qualified to be doing what they're supposed to be doing do they have adequate training? And it's not even just a surgeon. Is where you're going a reputable place? Do they have good staff? Do they have good anesthesiologists? Do they have good therapists? Do they have good nurses? It's the team effort. It's not just, oh, I do MIS surgery and I'm on YouTube promoting that. So I, I, I would implore people just to be careful not to fall for catchphrases. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. And then even just from the physical therapy side, you know, I, a lot of the patients I work with, they really do like that team approach, just our communication between therapist to surgeon, our PAs, you know, really is a, you know, holistic approach looking at somebody and making sure everyone on the team knows the plan and knows those steps to move forward. And then you, you, you alluded to this a little bit before, and I can touch on the PT side a little bit later. So you know, with either minimally invasive or different type of procedures that you do, what would, how would you classify or talk or walk someone through the recovery for these, for these surgeries? So re in my, in my opinion, recovery sometimes is dependent on more of the patient than the surgeon. So, and what do I mean by that? So biology is biology. If you, if you cut your skin with a blade, it's going to take 10 days for your skin to heal. That's standard, that's biology. If you break a bone, a long bone, your femur, your tibia, it takes 16 weeks for a bone to heal. That's biology. Uh, so, you know, so I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter what surgery you do, you're going to have some type of incision. That incision is still gonna take two weeks to heal. And so the recovery, um, to me, a lot of it is host factors, what the patient brings to the table. So if I have a patient who's coming in for a spine surgery and that patient has been healthy all their life, They've stayed active, they're not, they're not overweight, they don't smoke, 
they don't have poorly controlled diabetes, their recovery is going to be quicker. Okay. Um, uh, and, and, and so I factor that in. And, and, and the reality is most people who are coming in for elective spine surgery um, are not necessarily needing physical therapy immediately after surgery. Now, you do need activity immediately after surgery. We want everyone walking after every surgery. It doesn't matter what the surgery is. We want you walking. Um, but the real therapy, and, and this is where our colleagues come into place, really starts, I'll say, two to four weeks after surgery. You got to let the wound heal. If the wound is not healed, it's really hard to do any meaningful therapy. So um, I do work in concert with a lot of uh, therapists. Sometimes I actually do prehab. It's not everyone that just needs after surgery physical therapy. Some people I say, go to therapy first, maybe even try to lose some weight, maybe try and get some mobility going, some conditioning going before you do your surgery so that your recovery thereafter is that much smoother. But sometimes we're just limited by host factors. Has your wound healed? Yes or no. If the wound is healed, we can, produce, uh, we can uh, progress to more advanced physical therapy. But um, I usually, I typically tell patients activity immediately after surgery and real therapy doesn't start to two to three weeks after surgery if they need it. Not everyone needs it. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, you know, and I, I do talk, um, I do some uh, pre-op physical therapy sessions, it's like these educational such, sessions, and, you know, some of the, you know, instructions from the docs are, you know, hey, you don't need therapy right away, and, you know, a lot of people actually are surprised, but, you know, following that surgery, we do recommend always being active, like you said, with a walking program, and, you know, from, from my standpoint, too, when I am working with someone maybe four weeks, five weeks, six weeks after surgery, you know, everyone wants to rush to the, the best exercise or really get back to golf or all these activities. You got to let the biology take its course. You got to let the healing, you know, you can even say rushing that might complicate the surgery. So big on, 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 on that front too, from, from the physical therapy side. And I think we'll go through maybe one or two more questions and we'll open it up for the, the discussion for the Q and A. Um, I think this is a, this is a good one, you know, so the, the topic of surgery, you know, it, it can be a big decision, right? Um, from a patient's perspective, are these new spinal surgeries and techniques, are they reliable? And also in terms of like success rates on these, you know, could you shed light on, on that? Uh, great questions. Um, I think the outcome of a surgery um, really depends on paying attention to the principles, the fundamentals. So you can do the sexiest, the newest technique, but if you don't accomplish the fundamental principles, it, it's not going to work. So a lot of times people ask me, well, how big is my incision gonna be? And my response typically is, it's gonna be as big enough as I need it to be to do a good job. Um, and so what are the fundamentals that I'm referring to? I'm referring to um, a lot of times decompression is what most people need. When people come in with degenerative conditions or uh, 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 a sports injury from a slip disc, herniated disc, pinched nerve, what they really need is pressure off that nerve. It's a decompressive procedure. If I do it a traditional way and I, and I get a good decompression, that patient is going to be happy. If I do it the newest way and I get a suboptimal decompression, yeah, the patient may say, look at my incision is very small, but they may have residual pain in their foot from that nerve compression because I never took the pressure off. And believe it or not, there is a learning curve that comes with newer technologies. Um, with newer technologies, sometimes the surgeon needs to have done 20, 40, 50 to become proficient at decompressing that nerve the way they would do it the, the normal way, right? The, the old traditional way. So I, I try not to compromise technique versus fundamentals. Um, and, um, and that's why I try to impart to my patients. Um, it's really about making sure that we, we achieve what the fundamental issue is. Is it a decompression? Is it stabilization? Is it deformity correction? And how we choose to do it thereafter is dealer's choice. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I think I'm going to turn it over to the, the Q&A. Um, so thank you for all submitting your questions. Um, I see some of them have been answered in the chat box. So I'm just going to start from um, the top. Um, so would arthritis of the spine increase the risk of vertebral fracture in a person with osteoporosis? No. Um, so that's a, it's a good question, but I see a lot of patients misunderstanding the difference between osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. So think of one as a degenerative condition, meaning, um, for, for example, the facet joints that line the back of the spine these joints actually have cartilage in them and cartilage is supposed to be smooth and cartilage and cartilage allows for a smooth gliding and less friction. 
As we all age, cartilage thins out, it becomes rough, you get bone on bone arthritis. That could be considered osteoarthritis. That's very different from osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is bone mineral density. And in all of us, after the age of 30, our bone mineral density decreases, meaning that there are two cell types in the body. There's osteoblasts and there's osteoclasts. B, osteoblasts building, these are, uh, these are cells that build bone in your body throughout, throughout life. Osteoclast C, class cutting away, these are cells that remove bone throughout your body, throughout your life. There's a fine balance between how much bone you make and how much bone you take away. So as we're growing up from childhood to adolescence, we're making more osteoblasts and using more osteoblasts and osteoclasts. We're building more bone. But in everyone after the age of 30, that ratio changes to where you start to remove more bone than you lay down bone. And some, some um, conditions in life allow those conditions sometimes to, to, to happen at a very inverse rate. Uh, and some people, and some people is genetically inspired and some people in women, for example, you hit menopause and all of a sudden your hormones have changed in your body and that ratio may change. And that's why osteoporosis is more common in postmenopausal women. So think of those two things as separate things. One is quality of the bone, how thick is the bone, how resistant is the bone to compression, to load. And the other is just plain old arthritis from degeneration. And sometimes they're not, mute, they're, they're not always linked. You can have osteoporosis and not have degenerative conditions. You can have degenerative conditions and not have osteoporosis. And then the last thing I'll say about osteoporosis is many different things drive osteoporosis. It could be just natural age. It could be a problem with your thyroid. It could be a problem with your parathyroid. It could be a brain problem that throws off your hormones that drives the osteoporosis. So th those are two completely separate things. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have one, um, this one's actually pre pretty interesting. So it says, although there, there are many advertised, is there anything that can truly help one stand upright? So great question. Um, the natural order of things in life is, I always tell my students and my residents uh, that life is a kyphosin event. A kyphosin event, meaning that you tend to curve into a C. And if you think about the circle of life, when you are in, as a fetus in the womb, the baby is curved in a C position. In order for a baby to stand upright, certain parts of the spine have to go from kyphosis into lordosis in order for a human being to stand upright, meaning your lumbar spine as a baby in the fetal position becomes lordotic, your cervical spine becomes lordotic in order to get your head centered over your pelvis so you can stand up straight as a human being who walks in two feet. But as we all age, the circle of life, things start to break down and you'll notice that we all start to shrink in our 40s, our 50s. And if you have osteoporosis, that process happens even more. So in a certain way, you can avoid it, but are there things you can do throughout your life to, to mitigate that? Potentially, yes. Maintain a healthy weight. Avoid nicotine products. What do I mean by nicotine? Nicotine uh, causes vasoconstriction of blood supply. Uh, and certain parts of your spine already have poor blood supply. So if you have a habit that limits blood supply, you're accelerating degeneration. So the only things you have in your control to avoid falling over and tipping over as you become older would be to stay active, maintain a healthy weight, avoid nicotine products. That's really it, staying active, being mobile, doing some form of exercise every day, keep those muscles under tension, um, conditioned. Those are the only things you have in your control. Perfect, yeah, you know, I think gravity is, is remained undefeated. Uh, we have not figured a way to overcome that. With Correct. Conditions. Um, so this will be basically at, um, answering two questions that are in the group. So just kind of what are your thoughts on, I know you mentioned some of these degenerative uh, conditions, but any potential treatments for spinal stenosis? Yeah, so, so um, let me share my screen again. I think I have a, a nice depiction of what spinal stenosis kind of looks like in my slideshow. And let me just go through this real quick. All right, so spinal stenosis. So here is, um, the center of the uh, spinal canal. The front, the top here is the front of the spine. The Y shape is the back of the spine. The center is the tunnel, okay? And think about the tunnel like literally a tunnel where cars go through. And as arthritis sets in, that tunnel tends to narrow. And stenosis simply means narrowing. So on the left side is an MRI where you can see that that tunnel is open. You can actually see the little nerves on the inside of the tunnel. The white is cerebrospinal fluid. 
in the spine that has stenosis, you see how tight that tunnel has become. And as we all know, nerves do not like anything squeezing on them. So in that bottom left image, the C image, those nerves are being squeezed because that's, that space is too tight. Um, the nerves sometimes are very resilient. So do you always need to rush into a procedure to open up the spine when you have spinal stenosis? The answer is no. A lot of times when the nerves are being squeezed, if they're mildly squeezed, they're inflamed, they're irritated. If you do anti-inflammatory medications, that will address your spinal stenosis. Uh, the next step outside of anti-inflammatory medications will be epidural steroid injections into that space. If you inject the steroids, the steroids are anti-inflammatory, they bathe those nerves and that also helps the inflammation, you feel better. And the people who don't respond to oral medications and injections, those are the people where we physically come in here and we open up that space on the bottom so that it looks like the space on the top. And that's, we have different techniques to address stenosis. So, but that usually starts with non-surgical options. You, you take anti-inflammatory medications to calm down those nerves that are being squeezed. And then you shift and pivot to injections. And then ultimately, sometimes you do need surgery. Perfect. And we have a couple, maybe I think we have time for maybe another two more. Um, I have one question here. It says, what types of treatment are there for SI joint dysfunction? Great question. So sacroiliac joint, you have two sacroiliac joints on either side where your spine meets your pelvis. That's a very crucial junction. If you think about it, the weight of your body sits from there and that weight gets transferred to uh, your left and right legs. So even though that joint does not move a lot, that joint can be problematic. The, 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 the problem with the SI joint is it's often overlooked in a lot of people's lives. Uh, people always, oh, it's your back, it's your back. We've done research that shows that 30% of the time, the problem is actually your SI joint. The reason it's overlooked is because it doesn't always show up on imaging as looking bad. So people then say, well, it doesn't look bad on the MRI, so it can't be that, but it can be. And there are many treatments. It could, you have to find out why do you have that problem? Do you have the problem because you have an inflammatory condition such as rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis? Do you have the problem because you injured your ankle and you wore a boot and you wore that boot for three weeks or, or three months and it shifted your gait and now the joint is inflamed? Do you have the problem because you had a bad car accident and that joint was jolted out of place? There are many reasons to have an SI joint problem. And the only way you can accurately or treat it best is to figure out why you have it to begin with. So there's some people who've worn that boot for their ankle problem. And when they stopped wearing the boot, that their SI joint pain went away. And there's some people who realize, oh, wow, I do have rheumatoid arthritis. And when I get on my rheumatoid arthritis medications, my SI joint pain is better. So there are many different reasons. Um, and once you figure out the reason, it makes it easier to treat. And then the treatment options range from treating the underlying condition to injections, to pressure across the SI joint in, in the form of a belt. And there are procedures for SI joint um, uh, uh, instability, micro instability called SI joint fusions. And we do those as well. Yeah, thank you. I think that was a, a great approach on, on looking at that. You know, I, I tend to see even on my side too, you know, someone may be in a boot or have a maybe a knee replacement or a different surgery or something that can really throw off um, different um, aspects of the back. So I think that's a great, you know, holistic approach to look at. Um, so we have, um, this is a three-part question. I'll, I'll read the first two parts of it. So it says, are there any advances in treatment or surgery for spondylolisthesis? And I'll let you answer that one first, and then I'll go to the second part. Yes, so spondylolisthesis is really just a movement of one vertebral bone on another bone. Um, and sometimes that movement can be anterior, which is forward, backwards, or to the side. Um, and, and I would say this, majority of the spondylolisthesis we see don't ever need surgical treatment. They're just there and they're not really getting worse. In fact, the, the, the rate for a spondylolisthesis to worsen over the course of one's lifetime is about 7%. So it's not that high. Are there factors that can cause that, that slip to worsen? Absolutely. So what are the treatment options? Well, if it's, if it's a slip, it means that whatever hole the nerve is coming out from is going to be narrow. So if that slip is getting worse or if it's shifting back and forth dynamic, dynamically throughout the day, it's irritating the nerve. And typically that's a stabilization procedure. From, so, so most spondylolisthesis need some type of fusion procedure done. So the short answer to the question is, Luckily, majority of people with spondies or slips don't need any intervention. 
Um, you can buy time with injections in some people, but if you do need an intervention, as of today, most of the time it's a, it's a fusion surgery, most of the time. And then the second part of that question, um, it was more for, I guess, the, on the topic of osteoporosis. Um, um, the question said that they are, they're on for TEO for osteoporosis, but they have been reading and looking into that this is potentially um, uh, causing our arthritis or cartilage in the spine. Is there any clinical trials or anything that you're aware of in regards to Forteo and osteoporosis? So I can tell you, believe it or not, Forteo is actually one of the better um, drugs for osteoporosis on the market. So if you remember, I talked about osteoblasts and osteoclasts, how the body makes bone and takes away bone. Um, so in osteoporosis, you're taking away more bone than you're making bone, so your bone quality is weaker. A lot of the old osteoporosis medications were designed to stop the body from taking away bone, so slow down the taking away of bone. Forteo, for the longest time, was the only FDA-approved medication that actually builds bone. One of the problems with Forteo was when they did the initial experiments, they used animals as the model. They didn't, they didn't experiment on human beings with Forteo before the FDA approval. And in animals, they used a very, very high dose. And they found that in certain animals at a very, very, very high dose, if you use Forteo for too long, there's a risk that maybe you might form some type of cancer. So when the FDA went to approve that medication, they said, well, we're not gonna allow a high dose in humans. We're only gonna use a very small dose in humans to help mitigate that risk of cancer. And after two years, you have to come off that medication. So whoever's prescribing Forteo to you, and it's usually your rheumatologist or your endocrinologist should be able to explain what the risk profile is. A lot of times, if you tell them, I have a history of breast cancer, I was just treated two years ago, they won't even put you on Forteo because in the research animal studies, there was that risk of cancer linkage. So, um, but for specific to cartilage, I am not aware of any um, adverse effects of cartilage from the use of Forteo. All right, thank you. So. I think that's all the time we have for today. You know, I definitely learned a lot of these, uh, about these different spinal conditions from the surgical, non-surgical side, um, as well as uh, the robotics, which I think is a very interesting topic that's gonna be constantly evolving. So this, this conversation might be different maybe five, 10 years. Um, so I would like to thank you all again for tuning in. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about HSS, feel free to email communityed at hss.edu or visit hss.edu.